All right, so today we're focusing on descriptive statistics. Now, descriptive statistics is a very overarching kind of concept that covers more than what we just did in Unit 1. Okay, unit 1 was about shape center spread. It was about like single variable data, quantitative versus categorical. But this also takes into account bivariate data, which was your scatter plots, your regression lines, and all that jazz. Okay, So this is a very broad topic, and we're going to kind of fly through it a little bit. But I think you guys can handle it because this is most of the stuff is pretty much if there's anything that's going to be more common sense, if you can just kind of bring it back to your memory, that's what this stuff is. So when we're talking about descriptive stats, what do you think is the number, what are, what are the most important things when we're descri describing? Shape center, Shape center spread. Thank you. Context. You absolutely, did you just call him Tom? <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, what? Tom. So yeah, shape, center, spread, hugely important. And in all you do, context. And I think what we've seen as we go through that all of the practice that we've done, all of the practice problems, everything, you see that really one of the biggest places y'all miss points on is context. So please, please, please try to make sure in any free response question you always put it back in context. Even if it's probability and you just put a little label on it. Okay? So when we talk about this, the first thing you describe is shape. Give me some examples of shapes for graphs. Did you say little? What? Everyone's all over the place. Give me get your that one. Unimodal. Skewed. Multimodal. That's not a shape. There's one other. We've talked about unimodal, multimodal, which grabs the binomial, bimodal in there also. Skewed and symmetric. What's the one? Uniform. Okay. And remember, uniform is the one where it's perfectly straight across. That's where we don't think that, that any event is more likely to occur than, than the other. So if you were to graph all of the outcomes from rolling a dice 200 times. It should be a fairly level graph, as long as your dice is fair. Okay? So we have all of those different types. So again, symmetric, when it folds onto itself. When we are talking about non-symmetric, we have skewed. How do I determine which direction something is skewed? The tail. Because remember, the tail is, is you grabbing the graph, you're grabbing the data, and you're pulling it that direction. So it's going to take your average, and it's going to pull you in the direction of the tail. Okay? Skews can be, sometimes they'll call it positive, which do you think is going to be a positive skew? Right. To the right. Greater than, to the right. Negative skews, less than. And please be very, very careful. One of the, the AP exam's favorite things to do, and it's evil, is they will do a histogram or a semi-leaf plot or dot plot where they have a vertical main axis and the frequencies are coming off in the horizontal. And they just like to mix it up. And they'll put sometimes they'll put the biggest numbers on the bottom and the smallest numbers on top. So please, please, please pay very close attention to what the values are. Because if it's skewed left, it's skewed towards the lower values. If it's skewed right, it's skewed towards the higher values. So be very careful with that. We've talked about uniform, and then when we have our modes, typically when we're talking about describing the modes, we don't usually throw that in very much unless we're seeing like several peaks that might indicate multiple groups. Like, hey, wait a minute, why are there two different peaks in the height of these students? Huh, maybe that's the guys and maybe that's the girls. Okay, why are there two different peaks in the distribution of how much time people spend on homework? The people that care, the people that don't care. Right? So that's when it's a little bit more important. And then when we're talking about shape, you do want to make sure that if you have any gaps or any unusual features, that you do kind of tie that in there. That's sometimes the unusual features are classified on their own, sometimes they're just pushed into shape. Okay. Give me some specific shapes, some specific distributions that we have. Normal. Mm, students T, 
chi squared. You just picked up two more. Geometric and binomial. Those are all distribution shapes. So when we're talking about one of those specific ones and we describe shape center spread, that first letter is the shape. And then it's center and then it's spread. Not all of them have nice centers. The uh, binomial, I'm sorry, geometric doesn't always have a nice center. It's just depending upon what the proportion is. All right. Then we're talking about, what do you want to guess? Center. Yes. Now, the center, how you decide to label center is going to depend upon the shape. If my data was symmetric, what do I use? Mean. Why do we use, why don't we use the mean for other distributions? It's sensitive to outliers. Don't bully it. Don't push it around. If you're going to push it around, pick something else. So we start with the idea of the mean, the average. If it's not symmetric, what do we do for center? Median. This is the tough guy. He can stand up to bullying. And then mode. I mean, again, mode we haven't really dealt, dealt with very much. It's like, yay, you were in the category with the most. You're not, yeah, you're not unique. Good for you. Yeah, sometimes it's nice to kind of identify who your modes are. But the only time mode really plays a role is if it's symmetric. Because if it's symmetric, your mean, your median, and your mode should all be pretty much the same thing. That's how you can tell something is good and symmetric. Okay? Shape, center, spread. Okay, so when we're talking about spread, that's anything having to do with variability. Like, how predictable is it? How predictable, predictable is tomorrow's weather? That's when we're talking about the variability of tomorrow's weather. And depending upon certain times of the year, who knows what Mother Nature's on because we go from 80 degrees to snowing. I don't get it. Welcome to Virginia. That's a lot of variability. Narrow variability is if I were to go and predict the average um, or predict the age of a student in an AP statistics class. It's got very limited variability. Usually a three, maybe a four-year range. Okay, very, very good predictability there. So if I'm going to be talking about symmetric data, what do I use for spread? Standard deviation. Very good. How does standard deviation relate to variance? Square standard deviation to get the variance. So they're basically the same thing. They're just kind of tied by a different calculation. So the standard deviation is standard, what you would expect deviation to be off by. So it's looking at all of your differences between observed and expected, and it's finding the average of those. If your data is skewed, we're not going to use standard deviation. What do we generally go to? IQR. So IQR, and this is really, really important, is quartile 3 minus quartile 1. And IQR, that number is actually used in a calculation for something else. What is that? Calculate the outliers. How many interquartile ranges? 1.5. 1.5 is what determines our fences. Remember, this is for the skewed data. This is not normal. Normal, we talk about standard deviations and we say more than two standard deviations. IQR is different. So that's when we've got my lovely little box plot, wherever and however it's shaped. If these are not your fences, like if this is actually your data, that will be your minimum, where this will be your maximum. This line here is your Median, this is Q1 and Q3. And so for your interquartile range, you would find your interquartile range, and you would go from the quartile, one and a half, and anything beyond that point is an outlier. Whereas we said string, uh, uh, extreme outlier was, that's where the three comes from. Okay? Kind of coming back to you a little bit? Been a while. Now, um, this is just saying what we were talking about. If the data is pretty much symmetric, you can use mean and standard deviation. 
we do not use those for skewed data or data with outliers. And if this, this phrasing is very important because I love to put this on someplace on the test. You have to understand that mean and standard deviation or even variance is sensitive to outliers or skewness. Okay, it's easily affected, which is why we use uh, medians and IQR if it's not. Now, mode and range, those can be interesting tidbits of knowledge, but the overall range itself might not be very beneficial. Like, hey, guess what? The range of incomes of people in the planet go from zero dollars to one billion dollars. Uh, okay. That tells me nothing. It's like, look, people make money, people don't make money. So the range itself can sometimes be so big it doesn't make any sense. But it's sometimes a nice little benefit to throw in there. Now, transforming data, this is what we, we talked about this when we did Unit 1, but we also talked about this in the last unit when we were talking about probability. This is that idea of taking my center. I took all of your test grades, and I gave everybody a five-point bump. What does that do to my distribution? Yeah. Slides. Slides it over. So what did it do to the center of that distribution? Moved it fived up. So we would take the average and just add five to it. What did it do to the variability? Nothing. So when we're adding or subtracting one value from every single data point, it's going to do that value to the average, but it's not going to do anything to the spread it is going to be the shape that's going to change for the others and the spread. So let's say I were to take everybody's last test scores, say, eh, I didn't really want it to be out of 180 points. I wanted it to be out of 120. So I'm going to multiply every single person's score by 1.2 to kind of make the points level out. What is that going to do to my graph? Does it go like this? Does it go like this? What point is it going to change if I multiply it by 1.2? The only number that you can multiply by that it won't change. Zero. So wherever your zero is, it's like locking it in there. All the other stuff stretches. Is that going to change my center if I multiply? Is that going to change my spread? Yes. Okay. So the multipliers do affect measurements of spread. Location, mean, median, mode. Even if I wanted to talk about quartile one, where is it going to be? Quartile three. Any location is affected by everything, but only the spread is limited to the multipliers. Okay, ready some for, for some multiple choice? Some of these, and I'm going to promise you, because this one was one that I got wrong, because I don't like to read. I just assume things. Please read the question, or else you're going to get it wrong. Talk amongst yourselves, debate. Seriously, talk to each other, argue it out. Sit there silently. What do you think people might miss on this question? Largest. False and just the largest value. I read through that and I immediately just assumed, oh, they're doubling all the values. That's not what they're doing here. They're only doubling one value. That value happens to be the largest value. So which of the following there is false? C. C, senor and senorita. C. Okay. All right, let's try another one. When I asked you guys this t question on tests and quizzes, it was large amounts of bombs. Not pretty things, but it's not a hard question, and hopefully you guys have learned since then. Oh, yeah, I 
At the top of each page, it says unit followed by a number. Put them in order by number. Surprise! All right, what do you think? See? What do each of those numbers represent? A quartile. 35, 68, 77, 83, 97. What percent of the data is in here? What percent is within here? What about here? Okay. So if I'm looking at between 77 and 83, how do I do that? Either times it by 0.25 or divide by 4. That's it. Okay. A lot of you guys have been dealing with so much data that at this point in time, you're going to see a list of numbers and go, oh, I'm going to put it in my list. I'm going to do something with my list. This has nothing to do with your list. For Rizzle. Okay? So make sure you don't just kind of go for your knee-jerk reaction. You've got to just think about what the question's talking about before you move on. Okay? Another one that you guys bombed on types and quizzes, but you're going to get it right now. Caroline, if you need to stand up, stand up. Please look at the question. Which one could be true? What can you eliminate? The second one, right? Because how many 18s are there? Two. How many Ys are there? Three. So automatically, problem number, that second answer is out. Okay? Um, for my Ys, what is the smallest value that Y can be? No. Twelve. What is the biggest value that Y could be? 15. I didn't say that each of those were different numbers. All we said is that we ordered them from smallest to greatest. Okay? So that means that it's quite possible that we have just 14, uh, sorry, four 12s in a row or four 15s in a row. Please don't assume that they have to be different numbers. Okay? So now the way I talk about median and first quartile is I do it this way. I work my way crossing off one from each end. Median. Okay, so far so good? And then I start with that median, which is the last y, and the minimum, which is 2, and I work my way in. Quartile 1. Can the median and the first quartile be equal? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So, one is out also. And since none of your answers here say that none of the above work, two is going to be an outlier. And two is going to be an outlier no matter what, because if I'm going from here to here, which are basically my quartiles, the biggest my inner quartile range could be would be what? Six. Six. Six is the absolute largest that it could be. That's one and a half times six. Nine. 
12 minus 9? 3. That's an outlier. Okay. These guys are all much tighter in here. Would this be, uh, what kind of data would this be? What's the shape of this? Skewed left. The tail is on the lower end. Okay. So the answer here is C3 is the only one that could be true. Okay. Be very, very careful. I smell tricky problems. I don't really smell a problem. That's just weird. Do you kind of understand what's, what makes this tricky? What does make this tricky? Yeah, the orientation of it is weird. When they do that vertical um, data axis. But it's also the fact that they started with the smaller numbers, and as you go down the row, you get bigger. So let's talk about the skew. It's obviously not going to be symmetric, so it's going to be skewed left or skewed right. Which direction is it skewed? Skewed to the right. Why is it skewed to the right? Because those are the larger numbers. At the very bottom of the graph, that's 60 and 65. Top of the graph is 20. So the tail is pulling it towards the larger values. The larger values on a typical number line going left to right is on the right. So this is skewed right. So we are down to B and D. So what do you think about the this is saying what would you ex would you expect the mean to be higher or lower than the median higher because the direction of the skew is when you're pulling your average in that direction so this is going to take my app my median is probably going to be around here someplace between 30 and 40 my mean is going to be higher than that okay these are not like crazy, oh my god, I'm having to sit here and calculate so much stuff, types of problems. But they are thinking problems. You can't race through them else you're going to miss some of the key words. Try this one. I have this and two more questions. So let's try to eliminate at least one. Can I determine what the mean and standard deviation is going to be? Yes. So E is out. We can narrow it even further. Is the mean going to be 76.2 or 61? 76.2. What happened with this one is they did the order of operations wrong. Okay? Yeah, it's really kind of weird how they did this. So you were supposed to multiply by 1.2 first, then add the 15. So now we're down to these guys. This says the standard deviation stays the same. Does the standard deviation stay the same? No, what is it affected by? The multiplier, not the bonus points. 
So that's why it is not A, it is B. Okay? What I'm trying to get you guys to understand here is that the test is moving further and further away from here. Do some calculations for me. Here, put this data into a table and tell me what the average is. Okay? They're not doing that. They're trying to figure out, do you understand the concepts? And that are these types of questions. I think when I asked you this question on a test, I had 50% get it wrong. I want you to feel how much you have grown. Bless you. You should be able to eliminate quite a few right off the bat. What is it that I'm looking for here? Center. The number of people in this class who just flew over this problem, ignored the fact that it was asking for center, and said, ooh, 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 like you are. Okay, you got to be careful. That's what was going on at the beginning of the school year. You might not remember it, but I remember sitting there going, but why? When I'm grading your papers. Okay? So what can I eliminate from this? IQR and standard deviation, those are measurements of spread. Quartile 1 is a location, but it's not the center. So am I going to be using the mean or the median? Median. Skewed data, go to the median. Okay? Median is more resistant to those outliers. Okay? Try this one. I think this one is probably the hardest question for today, and it's also the last of these PowerPoint questions. Wait, why can't it be can you eliminate anything? What can you eliminate? E shows the mean. Why can't I eliminate that? You can calculate the mean, but you're not guaranteed the mean is going to be one of your data points. Okay? What else can I eliminate? Percentage. Whenever we're talking about percents, perc that has nothing to do with a dot plot or, or a um, stem and leaf plot. Because we don't have percentages, we just have observations. Okay? Uh, which means I can also eliminate one other. B. Why can I eliminate B if I eliminated D? Relative frequency is, again, a proportion, a percent. So we eliminate both of those for the same reason. So now we're down to either A or C. If I'm talking about shape, histogram, stem and leaf plot. Is the shape going to be same? Because basically a histogram is drawing boxes around your numbers. Ooh, look, it's a histogram. Histogram, stem and leaf plot. Back and forth. So is there an advantage to one or the other? No. The one thing a stem and leaf plot does for you shows all the data. That is the nicest thing about a stem and leaf plot. I can recreate all of my data super duper quick. Okay? 
So for these problems, we've been focusing on like that unit one type stuff. I am going to be giving you a worksheet. And the worksheet actually says at the top quiz. This is not the quiz. I decided to like really look at the problems and say, Whew, which one's harder? That's this one. I'm giving you the harder questions right now. Okay. You have your notes. You have each other. You have 10 minutes. It's six problems. You said they're the hardest ones. Yeah, it's harder than the other worksheet, but you've got each other. You've got your notes. You've got your flip, flip books. It is five multiple choice, one free response. Yes, you did. How you got in this class? What can I say? I bring with me my weapons of math instruction wherever I go. Oh, snap. Dad jokes.